For usual living on this channel is for educational purposes only and is not intended as financial advice. It's Macro Monday time. I had some interesting uh, data points last week. Kind of a flat week overall across most legacy markets aside from the indices, you know, tech sideways. So that's kind of where the entire market's at. But we've got PCE and GDP to talk about. And we also have this monster inflow, 326 million in the past week. I was hoping they had like a multi-month breakdown here. James from CoinShares, of course. But in any event, it is uh, up and to the right. That's what we want to see. We want to see inflows. We want to see the news matter. That's the biggest thing. You know, if we're releasing these products and nobody cares, we're just building empty cathedrals and price goes nowhere. If you're a true Bitcoiner, if you're a true libertarian, if you're a true capitalist, you want all products available to all people. And that includes ETFs. That includes BlackRock. That includes everything, right? Let's put everything on the table and see where the chips lay and see what happens and see what the inflows or outflows look like. And we're getting closer to that type of environment, at least in the United States. Now, the Canadian Purpose ETF saw quite a big inflow, as did the German product, which I don't actually know if that's spot. I don't think it is, but it could be. Most of these inflows came from Bitcoin and out of Ethereum, out of multi-asset. So again, this is institutional flows telling you alts aren't it right now. And Ethereum especially, right? Now Solana did get inflows and Solana did well, right? This is obviously after the fact retrospect, but you can see what the inflows do on the chart. Maybe it's the tail wagging the dog. Maybe price leads this. I don't know. I don't care. It fits the narrative. It makes sense. We're seeing flows in things that are seeing increases in price. End of story. We also saw some inflows into short Bitcoin last week and by country in US dollars, Canada, Germany, Switzerland, United States. It's good to see uh, the globe waking up a little bit. And on the topic of the Canadian ETF, TXMC puts together great YouTube stuff. Go follow him on Twitter and YouTube. You might not agree with everything he has to say, but he does provide an interesting perspective and viewpoint. It is very data-driven, as he says, in his commentary and content. But he was kind of asking, look, we've had a Canadian spot ETF for a couple of years and nothing's really happened. Why is the BlackRock spot ETF that much big of a deal, right? Who who cares? We already have a vehicle for this. Um, part of that, I would say in, in response is look, it's not American. Okay, that's number one. Not all brokerages have access to this stuff. And when you're talking about institutional products, as someone who spent uh, a year and a half with Valkyrie dealing with this stuff, it is very siloed in a sense that you need to have the money in the right places for people to access the right things. They, it's a trust network. It's, it's a club, right? And if you're not in it, you don't have access. So I think being skeptical about future flows is reasonable and we'll see what happens when it happens. But I wouldn't just completely discount it because we already have one, right? We already have this in other countries. And I, I wouldn't say Canada is more friendly to crypto regulation. I would say the opposite. They may be more friendly as far as uh, the Bitcoin spot. ETF product, but they are pretty anti-crypto, especially after what happened with Quadriga and the trucker stuff, right? Anyway, give him a follow. You won't agree with everything he has to say. He's also very anti-having in a sense that he's pro-business cycles, pro-liquidity, which I'll talk about in a second. So he, he provides some interesting data points and views that you don't hear often from the Bitcoin maxi crowd. Something else as far as flows are concerned, on the institutional side, uh, Galaxy put together this interesting potential flows that we'd see. Again, this would be another retort for who cares about the BlackRock ETF, right? Um, this is just a guess, right? This is an estimate. We have no idea. And we'll see how close this is one, two, three years down the line when it actually happens. But the trust, the availability, access, maturity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for BlackRock type products is different. It's a different level than uh, anything else that we've seen so far. On the Bitcoin side of things, uh, one last thing. So yesterday I did a pretty massive setup Sunday video. I talked about the Solana weekly cloud. I was using the wrong cloud settings. It wasn't a test. I just messed up. So <laughs> Solana is not actually in the weekly cloud yet for the crypto settings. However, I don't think the, the value, the 138 value, I don't think that changes too much. That's still the 50% retracement level. Solana still looks good. The reason I use the three-day clouds for a lot of these alt charts is I just don't have enough data most of the time 
for the weekly stuff, right? So never be afraid to use the lower timeframes if the weekly doesn't give you a great picture. This actually has just enough data where we can see the weekly cloud filling in and we can see the resistance levels. And really the difference here between the legacy settings and the crypto settings is the dis displacement of the cloud, the 26 versus 30 anyway. But so that's the, the difference you're seeing here. Solana still looks totally fine long-term based on price. Who knows about the uh, consensus mechanism or the community or the DeFi or any of that stuff. All right, for the legacy macro side, let's start with inflation. Trueflation printing a 2.39, which is what we like to see. We like to see 2 to 3%. You know, we had that monster GDP print. Markets went nuts because good news is bad news. And good news means higher for longer, seriously. And good news means rates are going to crush hopes and dreams of everything around us, right? Consumer credit, corporate credit, <laughs> like everything. Startups, I'll get to that in a second as well. You don't need to see the mortgage rates chart every week. You know, it's great to have the data. But if mortgages are 8%, yeah, mortgage applications are going to slow down. That's part of the game, right? Unless housing prices come down significantly, which we haven't seen yet. So inflation's still on the 2% uh, to 3% path. As far as the Fed estimate, 3.32% for October, which is down from 337 And that should come out sometime early in November. Obviously, we have the Fed press conference this week on Wednesday, something else to watch out for. As far as PCE is concerned, something that Paul will probably discuss is that PCE is very much headed in the right direction, continues to come down, continues to get closer to the target. We're not there yet, right? He's probably going to say all the things he's said already. And it's also worth noting again that the housing component is six months lagging at least. So this will continue to come down over time, most likely. And even though we're headed in the right direction, inflation is coming down, there's still a ton of consumer spending, right? Which is how we got that monster GDP print. As far as rate hikes, it's not going to happen, right? We're not going to get a rate hike this meeting. We may get one next meeting, but I doubt it. The Fed could very well just be done here. You know, I think it's too early to necessarily call that based on the pain we're seeing in certain aspects of the economy. People want the Fed to be done, but I think we're still on a, on a month by month basis because the Fed can't come out and say we are done. And then there's a massive party everywhere, right? And the markets go crazy. They have to like level set expectations a little bit, even though they might know where they want to be, right? And that the numbers are looking in a certain way that this is probably the ceiling on rates. But anyway, rates, next meeting, stay put. Uh, there's a lot of talk about upcoming treasury auctions, which really are massively out of my wheelhouse based on what they issue on which premia or duration. I have no idea, right? But if you want to follow that information, I'll put it in the description of this video. And we are continuing to see flows into TLT or zero or whatever the, the longer 30 plus year treasury fund is called. And people are just throwing money at this stuff, which the argument is, look, 5% plus for 20 years is great. Who cares if it goes lower price wise? The yield is good enough. I think that's what a lot of people are arguing, but I also think they're stuck in this previous 40 years where they just assume we're going to have another bullish bond market. But we'll see, won't we? Because TLT certainly doesn't look happy at these levels down here. We also had another uh, death knell for TLT or the long bond. We had this cover from Barron's last week, which is historically a inverse sentiment indicator. Just very interesting timing, right? Now, if you look at TLT, we looked at it yesterday, we talked about it a little bit. Maybe this is morphing into some sort of inverted head and shoulders, but the moment this makes lower lows, all bets are off. You can see the massive volume that came in here. I think that volume's at an all-time high. So based on the TA, I don't think you can make a super strong case for bearish continuation here. But based on the issuance, based on what just dropped on uh, what the Treasury expects you know, I don't even know what 1.6 trillion even means anymore, right? <laughs> like that's, we're just in super stratospheric type levels of debt issuance, but we'll see what happens on the treasury auctions coming up because that's what pushed TLT lower for the current leg is that treasury auction wasn't gobbled up as quickly as they were hoping. And that's the uh, technical term. Something else that I was looking at today, you know, I'm looking at the TGA, which is currently at around 835 billion they like to keep it around 500, right? You can, can sort of see that free COVID. We're getting student loan payments coming in. We're getting delayed, hyper-delayed California payments coming in. 
even with all that, even with what the TGA currently sits at, we're still looking at issuing a lot more debt. So it'll be an interesting ride throughout Q1 and Q2. We still haven't gotten our spending under control. War by default is inflationary for the most part. So it looks to many people like we will continue spending at the current pace without slowing anytime soon, at least not until you know the next election. And I don't think uh, Trump or Biden are expected to bring spending down considerably. Before we talk about GDP, let me mention today's video sponsor, Kraken Pro. Kraken Pro is a complete overhaul of a Kraken trading experience with a one-stop shop for advanced and professional traders. Kraken Pro enables efficient trading execution across multiple markets with a UI that allows for unique optimization tailored to your trading style. You can check out Kraken Pro with the link in the description of this video. One thing I was noticing on uh, Bitcoin over the past few days, a bit of a high and tight flag, as I mentioned yesterday, we're kind of triangling out here, which is generally bullish continuation. I don't see a lot of bullish sentiment generally. I still see people in legacy land saying how Bitcoin is a scam, you know, so, uh, the more of that we see, the better, the less of everybody's getting rich and you're not, we see the better, you know, we don't want to see stuff like this for Bitcoin, right? That That is historically not something you want to see. And we probably will see something like this for Bitcoin around the ETF for BlackRock. So the announcement's going to come and then it's going to get released or start trading uh, months after. And, you know, that's potentially a, a sell the top or uh, sorry, sell the news type of event, <laughs> which could be a top. And as a reminder, at least in the US, uh, there is a gold product. Should you be so interested in trading, especially as gold uh, made its way briefly above 2K back down again, I'll talk about gold at the end, but it's always good to know what you can trade and where. And uh, PAX G is one such option. As far as the GDP print is concerned, real, nominal, I don't really care, right? The reality doesn't matter. It's just the headline. You know, what is the headline? The headline is GDP is great. Looks amazing. Multi-quarter highs, right? And I saw people, analysts saying, you know, it was Barbenheimer. It was Taylor Swift. It was Beyonce concert. Right? <laughs> just sure. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it is fun, funflation. I don't know. But uh kind of a bizarre place that we live in where that's what our focus is. Although you could argue with a pandemic, with the younger generation not being able to f afford housing, right? <laughs> that they want to live their life and spend their money on experiences. And that's what we're seeing, especially in uh, travel as well. So 4.9, big number. What does that mean in the context of history? Well, BOA put together this uh, great chart to rain on everybody's parade to say, look, the GDP is often strongest right before the recession. So I'm not one of these doomer enemy at the gate people. Just the data point to consider. Just because we got a, a strong GDP print doesn't mean uh, recession is completely off the table. Calls for a recession from the NBER are going to be backwards facing anyway. So, you know, we won't really know technically if it's a recession until after it happens, but we'll certainly feel it in markets and uh, on the job side of things. The Fed GDP now estimate has us above 2% currently. I think that's how you read this. So we'll see how this looks as we go on here, but everybody was giving this estimate crap up until the actual release of the data. And what do you know? It was 4.9%, rather significant, even though it was, uh, as they say, slightly below their forecast. So just more data to consider. Uh, and as far as global liquidity, and this goes back to like the TXMC, as I was talking about in the beginning, you know, his analysis talks about four-year business cycles and having is less relevant and global liquidity is more important. Um, one of the best data sources for global liquidity is cross-border capital. This is from their Substack, but uh, they're kind of indicating, look, we may be at a, a cyclical bottom here on global liquidity. We're already store, sort of seeing China begin to release stimu stimulus. We may start to see that into the election cycle in the United States, right? So just something interesting to keep in the back of your mind as everything looks kind of doomy and gloomy, right? There still could be various types of stimulus coming. Um, this is another look at US liquidity relative to the yield curve. And their argument would be here, look, look like we are we have a bear steepener, sure, but this generally tends to follow liquidity. As the yield curve uninverts, we have seen jumps in liquidity historically in the United States, at least dating back to 2000. So something to think about when uh, you're thinking about, you know, being all in short anything. As far as mortgages are concerned, if we think about 
commercial real estate, the consumer, Main Street, average mortgage rates are way down here below 3%. So if you're not paying a mortgage or if you have a mortgage that's considerably lower than it is now, your spending picture probably looks a lot different than someone without a house or somebody looking to purchase a house currently, right? You're probably more flush with cash in a sense. And some of the spending data does back that up because it shows that the older boomers are the ones spending a lot, right? They're spending on experiences and travel because they have it, right? They have all the money. <laughs> and back to Main Street, the Mag 7, you know, those businesses for the most part are flush with cash or issued longer term debt at much lower levels, whereas short term borrowers, Main Street, small businesses are definitely feeling the crunch. And the longer this holds up, the higher the likelihood that businesses will continue to go under because they just can't get credit or they can't afford the credit or it just doesn't make sense, right? So it'd be interesting to plot this against some sort of small business closure data or unemployment or something, right? Because eventually something's got to give here. And that boils into commercial real estate as well, which I'm not going to go into detail here, but a lot of people are still working from home. A lot of people, businesses don't need offices anymore, right? So that distress risk is uh, growing substantially, especially in the United States. So we'll see what comes of that. That's a pot that's ready to boil over here within the next couple of quarters. As I was looking for student loan, again, back to this consumer spending narrative, right? Student loan data, I found this interesting graph, which looks at loans as a percentage of state personal income. And they're sort of arguing here that, look, tax revenue on these states is going to be impacted, especially in the South, where it looks to be a concentration of high student loan burden or student debt burden, maybe the mid Midwest as well. So even the, the student loan data gets pretty hyper-regional and isn't the same, certainly on a state-by-state -state basis. A few data points on tech, and then we'll talk about the MAG-7. But uh, the tech layoffs from established companies and startups appear to have slowed pretty significantly. You know, we're not really seeing or hearing about that for the most part anymore, mainly on the financial side. I think we're seeing the layoffs. Uh, I saw a round of layoffs for Schwab today. I think Microsoft maybe was laying off or announced layoffs last week as well. Uh, but if we look at some data from Carta, which handles the business side of a lot of startups, the shares and who gets the shares and whatnot, et cetera, it doesn't handle all of it, but it handles a good chunk of it. So their data is generally pretty representative of what's going on in startup land. And we're still seeing headcount shrink in startups. We're seeing startups close or shut down, right? The funding just isn't there. Real rates are significantly positive and that's pushing people out of the need to search for a venture capital fund or wanting to fund a startup, right? You can get five and a half percent today. Why bother with the startup? <laughs> and they're feeling the crunch. So it is definitely slim pickings in startup land. As far as the DXY is concerned, we had another down day today in DXY, which is again, what we want to see. We want to see sideways or down. We do not want to see 14 weeks of rip roaring bullishness. We do not want to see month after month of strong DXY. Best case here is we eventually retrace to the cloud at around 103. Worst case is we shoot to 111 plus. The timing on that obviously matters. You know, if we get some sort of BlackRock approval and DXY is on its way to 111, that may counteract. It flows, right? We'll see. I don't know. But how that actually lines up will be pretty interesting. Now, if we are sub 103 because of stimulus of some sort relative to the halving into 2024, then it's game on, right? Then the Bitcoin does Bitcoin things and the liquidity conversation takes over. But as we stand here, I don't really see anything in particular. You could argue some sort of mangled head and shoulders, maybe diamond toppy. I, I don't know. I don't really know if there's anything there specifically, but it doesn't look super happy at these levels. Gold finally saw some inflows based on uh, last week's data, and it did have quite a month or has had quite a month of October. This is a monthly chart. It's going to be slow. It was briefly above 2K. It'll be interesting if it can break out before ETH does making a new all-time high, which effectively is around 2080 or something like that. My guess is ETH still catches up eventually, uh, but you can't ignore this chart. A bullish gold should be bullish for digital gold. So that's also an interesting comparison to watch, but it looks fine for eventual bullishness. The good news for the inflation picture and oil, as many people are seeing at the pump, gas prices coming down. Oil looks to me potentially head and shouldersy, potentially toppy here. We'll see. I mainly saw this on the commodity index from yesterday, but this is good news for 
inflation and everybody buying gas every day, right? So that's what we want to see. And as far as the commercial banks, Joe with the Bloomberg terminal pulling this one out, that uh, commercial banks are down in deposits, almost 84 billion. And it's sort of expected, right? Mortgages at 8%, you're not going to buy a house. Yields at 5.5%, you're probably not going to sit in a savings account at 0.1%, right? That's just kind of what it is. You're going to move money to a money market, money market or some other vehicle where you can get that yield. And so this should just continue to happen. You really don't have any incentive to keep your money in the bank. So why would it gain assets here? As Bianco calls it, the bank walk. Uh, as far as the KRE regional banking ETF, I looked at this again today. And although it doesn't look super angry, it doesn't look happy. And wouldn't it be interesting if we hit some sort of lower low than the COVID low? Um, let's say, right, regional banks start blowing up left and right. Nobody wants that to happen. But again, it's kind of inevitable, inevitable if rates do stay higher for longer. And if we still see outflows on deposits, this still could be a lot of things. It could be a W, it could be Adam and Eve, it could be an invert head and shoulders, but it's way too early. But it would be interesting if we hit that 20 uh, ish level. As for the MAG 7, Apple probably looks the most angry. Well, I guess Tesla's the most angry, but from like a readable chart perspective, a lot of these charts have something going for them, a longer term inverted head and shoulders or a cup and handle. Maybe you could argue cup and handle here. You could certainly argue falling wedge. It's at the 200 day moving average. It's underneath the cloud. From a bullish perspective, what you want to see is this completely reset, get back above the cloud. Maybe that's 180. Maybe that's slightly lower over time. If you're playing the falling wedge, maybe this is a buy, but I don't think this is uh, for me at the moment. Microsoft to me looks much better than Apple. Apple does have some sort of event coming up today or tomorrow. Over the longer term, maybe this is a cup and handle. Shorter term, inverted head and shoulders. Looks decently okay. It's back above the cloud. And if this plays out as a cup and handle, 425, 475, you know, this is probably how Bitcoin gets to 4200 if things get loose on the higher end on uh, the mag seven if they start to explode i know we're not coupled with equities basically at all right now on the crypto side of things but if these reverse in a strong way then we probably see some sort of liquidity injection or something there's some impetus for that right this you could argue a longer term inverted head and shoulders on amazon on the bearish side of the equation for the mag seven there's a lot of talk of back taxes to be paid a lot of talk of anti-regulation or pro-regulation sorry sort of trying to break up big tech and that'll put a B in the bonnet of any of this, uh, these crazy bull targets. Right. But if Amazon is back above 146, yeah, I like it. You know, let it have its temper tantrum here between 120 and 150 and I'll be back in at the higher end. Uh, Nvidia still looks like a short to me. I finally pulled the trigger on some NVDS today. So we'll see how wrecked I can get on that 1.5 X short ETF. Still has an unfilled gap, still in the cloud. Trend says it's neutral. Stop loss for me on a short is anything above the cloud. Yes, everybody sees this as a head and shoulders. I get it, but I still like it. So I like uh, 320 to 350, whatever this unfilled gap is on NVIDIA. Google also has the potential for that cup and handle type setup. And it may take all of Q4 to handle out. I don't know, right? But something to watch. Now, if we break below the 200 day moving average, if we lose the 50% retrace here, we probably aren't cup and handling at that point. You know, that idea is invalidated. Now, Tesla looks much different from most of the mag seven. It is farther below its 200 day moving average, farther below the daily cloud, arguably broke down below a pretty big consolidation period. So this one's a massive avoid for me for quite some time. Measured move would be 125 to 160. And then lastly, Meta also looks good. You know, I don't love that company either, but from a chart perspective, maybe this ends up being a longer term cup and handle. Maybe this is a first mover relative to Google and Microsoft. And just something to consider with a lot of uh, bearish, doomerish narrative out there that I continue to see that I believe, right? But the chart is the chart and the narrative is oftentimes not congruent with price. That's all for this one today. Like, dislike, comment, share, subscribe, and happy trading.